lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain of strength, come unto me. Thank you guys so much. That right there is probably one of my most favorite songs in, uh, in the hymn book. Um, and, and it's mostly because I love to pretend that I'm a bass. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm really sort of bassy in the morning, and then as the day goes by, I just get a little higher. And, but I, lo I, love, the, I love bass and, and uh, trying to sing a little lower. And that, that song has like everything. You know, you're, you're out of the range on the front, on the top end. You're out of the range on the bottom end. It's just a perfect song. I, I just I love how it was written. Well, welcome to Campion Study Hour. Welcome to the Sabbath School class. For those of you who are regular attendees of this particular Sabbath School class, uh, we have switched it just a little bit. We won't be doing the Sabbath School lesson. We are in the middle of the West Central Young Adults uh, Conference, and so we have a special Sabbath School class uh, prepared uh, for, for this particular conference. And we're actually looking at, at the story of Abraham. We're going to get to the story of Abraham uh, in, in just a bit. Uh, Campion Academy students as their theme. They are going through Abraham, and so we decided to incorporate that into the Awaken uh, conference. Up here on the stage, I have, uh, I have a great uh, set of panelists that are wiser and better and better looking than, than me, and so that's why I picked them, and they make me feel young. Uh, I, I, am, I am the oldest one here. We'll take a moment of reflection for that. All right, next to me is, uh, we don't need any int introduction, but, uh, but this is Pastor Michael, uh, uh, Michael Getz. He is the lead pastor here at the Campion uh, Church. And uh, Pastor Michael, thank you so much for allowing uh, this conference to take place here and for being on the, on the panel. To my left, to my left is uh, Mindy. Mindy is the president of the West Central Young Adult Group, and she is a cowboy girl. <laughs> she, she is uh, born and raised on the farm with, uh, with cows and horses and big tractors, and I can't wait to see her farm one of these days because I like big tractors. Um, and then next to her is Siggy, and Siggy is the vice president of the West Central Young Adult Group, and uh, he is just a wonderful addition. These two are our main leads for the, for the team. Uh, us two on this side were the advisors for the group, and I tell you, God has blessed us, Michael, with, uh, with just two 
two talented young people that are uh, strong, strong leaders and love Jesus Christ, and I love to see that. So thank you guys for being on the panel. Let's bow our heads together as we begin. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for the rest that it provides. How, how much wisdom you had when you, when you did all of this. You created all of these things, and you realized that we needed a rest day. We needed a day to spend with you. And so today is a high Sabbath. Every Sabbath is actually a high Sabbath, Father. But today, we are here in your presence. Here's what we're asking. We need your Spirit. We're about to study the Word of God, Lord, and we cannot understand it without your Spirit. These are spiritual things, and spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So please, Father, please send us the Spirit of God to be with us, to open our hearts, to open our minds, to help us understand your word, and draw close to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My mind, as we, as we went through this study, my mind went to the opening of, of Scripture, the, the, the prolegomena, the beginning of, of Scripture. There uh, in, the, in, the opening, in the opening words, in the beginning, God. And this is, there's a, this a spectacular display, guys, of, of the power of God, of the supernatural power uh, going on right at the beginning. And I think that sometimes, that there, I don't know about you, but sometimes I read the Bible and I gloss over things, you know, just something that I've read in the past and I just, whoa, just run right through it and try to get to something else. And this is sort of, I think, one of these places where I've glossed over in the past. And so as I, as I was thinking about this study, I thought about those words, in the beginning, God created. And that, that uh, there's something that spoke to me and said, pause, pause for a moment and think through that. And I realized there is much more going on there than, than, than meets the eye. I think we, we need to not take that lightly. It's probably one of the most dynamic and, and sovereign statements that we find in Scripture is right there. In the beginning, God establishes God's authority. And God created establishes his authorship, his, his ownership, his, his power. And, and it's, it's no surprise then that end time issues, when we're talking about the end and what will be the, the issues in the end, that we're dealing with these very same uh, items, the, the authority of God, the, the authorship, the creatorship of God, all of those things Satan has tirelessly worked over the ages to bring into question. He questions whether God is the, is the author and creator. He questions whether, whether God is authority, and, and he tries to lead us away and, and makes himself, places himself on his man-made or devil-made throne and tries to pretend that he is authority. And God's response, we find God's response in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, part of the first angel's message, where he says, fear God. This is the end time message. He says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Revelation 14, 7 points us right back to Genesis chapter 1, establishing that God is, he is authority, and he is author. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was reading uh, some years ago uh, a statement where Ellen White said, it would do us well to just read Scripture slowly. Read a verse slowly and just stop and contemplate. There's much more uh, that meets the eye in, in all of these verses in Scripture. When God created, guys, God created perfectly. Uh, Genesis 1 31 records that God saw what he had made, and indeed it was very good. And among, amongst the jewels of his creation, the, the, the treasure that shone the brightest, the, the, the zenith of, of his creativity, uh, that's where we stood, Adam and Eve. We were right there. We were the top of his creation. He created us. He molded us. He, he stepped down. He, he, he got dirty. I love this part because God gets dirty in, in Genesis chapter, chapter 1 and 2. It gets down there and forms us and makes us out of the clay. It's the, the incredible love of God. He could have just spoken us into existence. Remember, God creates ex nihilo. He creates out of nothing. He just speaks it and it comes. But he didn't do that for us. He, he stooped down and he molded us and he fashioned us. And, and I, I love that. And then he laid on Adam and Eve just one prohibition, just, just simply one. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. You can eat of everything else. You can do everything else. Just don't eat of that tree. And unfortunately, um, Adam and Eve 
did that which they were asked not to do. They ate of the tree. And we're in this mess today because they ate of that tree. Uh, I have heard, this is sort of a, a by the way, it has nothing to do with the, with the uh, Sabbath school lesson, but uh, here it is. I have heard some say that when Eve wandered to the tree and began to talk to the serpent, and when she, um, when she said that God had said that neither can they eat it or touch it, lest they die, that touch it part. Some have said, well, that's sort of the beginning of the rebellion. Uh, there she lies about what God said because God never said in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, she not, he never says don't touch it. So that's sort of a lie. So just, just throwing that out, guys. Um, is there any evidence for or against uh, Eve lying there in Genesis chapter 3 before she eats of the fruit? Don't everybody speak at once. I know that was a powerful question. Uh, Alex, would it be fair if we, if we uh, allowed some interaction and, and maybe uh, volunteered Eddie or somebody to I would just hold that. that yellow mic? Chase, can you grab that yellow or, mic? Or Chase. Everybody's just bring it back down. Bring it to <laughs> just, Eddie. Just hold um, it there. And if, if you'd like to participate, if there's something that you'd like to say uh, and be involved, uh, just let us know and we'll... Chase, thank you. That was very nice. Your willingness. Yeah. Sorry, Siggy, you were going somewhere. You, you were about to say something. Uh, well, one of the things is that we see that you shall not eat every tree of the garden. I, 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 don't, ever, I don't think I've ever uh, heard or read or of anywhere that where God says, don't touch it, you know? I think in that moment, uh, she was being beguiled. I think the serpent was beautiful, was charming, and sort of got her off track. Yeah, there, there's a lot of those things that happen, right? Charming guys, charming girls, that are just <laughs> get, getting, getting off, off track. Uh, I'm going off track, so let me, <laughs> let me rein, it, rein it back. You know, I've, I've heard this question asked before, and um, I, I, I really don't think that she's lied here. I, I just think it's not recorded because remember when God created, He created perfect. Mm. She hasn't. Uh, she hasn't. You know, in in when we're talking about the Ten Commandments, uh, there's a there's a commandment there to not bear a false witness, and and we know that lying is a sin. And uh, nowhere in the Bible is it recorded that the first sin was a lie for Adam and Eve. The first sin is eating of the fruit. And so more than likely, she's actually told the truth. Um, it's just not recorded in Genesis chapter one and two. She's she's just you know, said, hey, this is what God said. We can trust her up to this point. A couple of verses later, and now you can't really trust anything they say. But uh, at least up to this point, we can, we can trust her. I see a, a hand right there. So I... Yellow mic. Is this on? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that I've seen and understood from what happened at the tree is just that Adam and Eve are redefining good and evil in their own eyes. So God has defined what's right and wrong. And so what's happened at the tree, it's a theme to teach us what happens in our lives daily that we are trying to redefine in our own eyes what's right and wrong. So that, that's the biggest thing I'm seeing. I don't know about the particularities of, you know, if she's lying or all that. All I know is that the main thing that I see present at the tree is that they're just they're just simply redefining good and evil on their own terms. Um, we tend to try to do that. That's right, and, and, and that's really the, the whole battle, isn't it? It's, it's the battle of, of self or, or of God. Will you allow God to be Lord of your life, or do you think that you have a, a better plan? And every, every time that we choose uh, the better plan that we think that, that's our own plan, we end up going astray because we are, we are definitely sinful beings. So I just, I, I approach it from, I'm in, I'm in dad mode in my life right now. I have two little girls. And that specific scenario, I guess in my mind, I approach it from the, the point of there are certain things that I've impressed upon their minds that are very serious, you know. So um, I think God, I'm not sure exactly what the conversation between God and Adam and Eve were when he talked to them about this tree. But I would assume, based on what we know about his character, that he impressed a very um, serious tone upon them when he discussed this tree because God can, could see the, the incredible destruction that would happen as a result of them um, breaking this law. And so I think, and sometimes with my kids, you know, I'll tell my daughter, um, 
just as an example, hey, you can ride your bike on the driveway. Do not cross this line in the concrete, okay? There are cars over there, but I, that's a serious thing. I have a very serious tone. There are serious consequences if I ever see you do it. Don't cross this line. And she is uh, so impressed by the, the seriousness of my tone, she won't go near it. And I think maybe Eve was just, whether God specifically said don't touch it or not, I think Eve is going, whatever God is talking about, he's dead serious about it, so I don't even want to touch this tree, much less eat it. And so that's, that's my approach. My approach is, hey, she's taking this very seriously, and just as my kids do, um, they'll stay a foot away from that line because they know it's serious not to go anywhere near that. Mm, yeah, that, that's, that's awesome, man. I appreciate that, um, especially from a, a father's perspective. Um, I've, I've got a bunch of children, and I'm thinking I'm going to send them to your house because, no, you know, the, I, I love it because, you know, you remember in the Bible it talks about not looking at the wine when it's red and swirling in the cup. And if you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed more than just Sodom and Gomorrah. It destroyed all of the surrounding cities as well. There's this element of proximity where we like to get into proximity of, of sin. And God's saying, don't even come close to it. Don't, eat, don't even touch it. Don't, don't even look at it because it will bite like a serpent. Love the transition right into the story of what got happened. one more here. Here. Eddie? I do. Okay. On the front. I think I'm blind. I'm not doing very well. No, it's all right. First day on the job. Yeah, so I just wanted to bring this up. Something that caught my attention was in, in the first verse of chapter 3 that uh, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty mm. than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. And, you know, for the lack of a better phrase, I guess, um, I guess what you could say is that the only advantage that Satan had, you know, with, towards God was that he was deceitful, you know, and God is very, um, he's truth, you know, he's, he's, um, he's, he has integrity, and, but um, the serpent, Satan, he was able to, to be crafty, and, and of course, you know, and don't quote me on this, but I believe, you know, like, I think I read, like, in Patriarchs and Prophets that, you know, the serpent was saying, you've already touched it, you might, like, well, you might as well just eat it like nothing happened and as soon as she touched it she's like oh you know you go a little step further and more and more and then eventually that's what leads to to ultimate destruction but but guys that's 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 god's or, or satan's method isn't it you've gone too far you've already done this or you've already done that i don't know how you're feeling today i don't know what you've done i don't know what i don't know what you've thought but i know that as soon as we take that first step then Satan is on us like crazy saying, God, it's too late. It is too late. God doesn't love you. You will not get into the kingdom of heaven. You might as well just give it up. And friends, it is a lie. It is a bold face lie. God's arm is strong enough to reach down and pick you out at any hole, no matter what. He is God, and he made a promise. If you confess your sins, what did he say? He is faithful and just to do what? to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And, and every time we say, no, 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 God won't forgive me of this, what we're saying is, God, you've lied. You're not faithful and you won't forgive me. And friends, that is not what God says in Scripture. Let's read Genesis, uh, Siggy, let's just read Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 6, and look a little bit at, uh, at this particular story, and then we want to ask a couple more questions. Yeah, definitely. Let's, let's, if you guys have your Bible or your phones, uh, let's go to Genesis 3, chapter 1, oh, chapter 3, 1 through 6. <laughs> now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God hath, doth know that in the day ye thereof then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. It's, it's interesting um, to think about uh, the story of, of Samson. Um, Samson, when he had his eyes, he could not see. But when his eyes were finally plucked out, then he could, he could see. We, we get so tempted 
by the things that we see, the things that we perceive. You remember in Samson's story, it was like, get her for me because she pleases me well. Uh, where there's this, this inner desire for, for pleasure that just drives us, and it drives us right to sin. We, get, we have to give those to, to God. In, in verse 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Sending it to you, Siggy, i got a question for you. Um, the pair has this major awakening moment there. All of a sudden, they're thinking, this is a great idea. I'm going to know uh, the, the difference between good and evil. I'm going to be like, like God. And as soon as they eat, all of a sudden, they find themselves naked. They find themselves separated from, from God. What's, uh, what's the implication there of, of what just happened? Because it seems, like, it seems like, like nothing, really. It seems like, oh, okay, so you're... you're, you're you're naked, and so they go out and make themselves close. I mean, but what's the significance of what just took place? Well, we see that they were naked before, and they didn't realize they were covered by God's uh, bright light, his mercy uh, his, uh, by himself, basically. And, and at that moment, they decided to do their own or do what their desire was wanting. They, they finally recognize it's like, whoa, we, like, what's been going on, you know? We've been, we've been naked this whole time, but, like, I think at that moment, there, it was a surprise, it was a shock, because they, it, it was just a complete 180. They, they didn't realize, and they came to realize something that they was not wrong and now is wrong, and so they go and search for coverings because they feel shamed and, and terrorized. Yeah, um, this gentleman that was just talking in the in the blue mask. There, this is that terrible. It used to be like the the red hair, the and now it's like the blue mask. Um, you know, you, you you made the comment earlier about uh, you know choosing God, choosing yourself, um, and and this battle that's going on in Genesis three, and um, it's it's fascinating to see that here once again, instead of immediately kneeling down and going to the Lord, they decide that they're going to fix it. I can, I can make some kind of solution for myself. We, we, we got this. We, got, we can handle this. We can sow uh, fig leaves. Fig leaves together because fig leaves don't die, right? But uh, they obviously had not realized that eventually those would get brittle and they would need another pair of clothing. Uh, just one, one little thing, too. Uh, from one of the writings that we see from Ellen G. White, she mentions that at first their only thought was how to excuse their sin before God and escape the dreaded sentence of death. So their first thought was like, oh man, like, how can we, ex how, do, how do we excuse ourselves? Like, how do we, you know? Yeah, and then it gets vicious because you got the blame game going on. Uh, yeah, one element that I noticed is that the sewing together the fig leaves, God was their provider in Eden. And so now they've become self-sufficient. We're now there, like you were just describing, now they're, they're, they're seeing how they can live apart from God, life without God, that they can really just do it themselves. And so um, all the way a, a, as we go through even the story of Babylon, right, that whole human system is about life apart from God, doing it yourself, trying to do it yourself, and uh, obviously that doesn't work. So that's kind of the element I'm seeing there. And even in their own self-sufficiency, go ahead. You'd better give him your name or he'll call you the man in the blue mask. Oh, uh, Nathan. It's Nathan. Nathan. Oh, Nathan, thank you. Um, Nathan with a blue mask. Uh, no, no. Uh, no, thank you for that, Nathan. And even in their self-sufficiency, here's the irony of it. Even in their self-sufficiency, they have to go to something that God created in order to clothe themselves. Uh, we, 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 we aren't self-sufficient, guys. There's, there's, there's nothing about us that is self-sufficient. We are sustained by the power of God. And, and, that, and that is it. Ezra chapter 9. We're, we're running to Ezra chapter 9 really, really quick. Um, not, uh, not for a long time, but you remember the story of Ezra chapter 9. They've gone back to, to rebuild um, the temple. We're studying this at the Voice of Prophecy right now. And, um, and Ezra is approached with the fact that uh, his leaders have intermarried with, with the, uh, the heathen, the, un, the unfaithful uh, pagans out there. And so he does some, some, some radical stuff. He, he grabs a, a, a lock of his hair. He pulls that out. He grabs his beard. That's why you don't have a beard, right? He grabs his beard, he pulls that out, um, some, some hairs there, he tears his robes, and then he, and then he kneels down uh, before the Lord, and he is absolutely quiet. Um, then he prays, and he prays powerfully. And what strikes me about this whole thing is that Ezra recognizes 
the sinfulness of sin. As soon as he hears it, he recognizes the sinfulness of sin. And it strikes me that Adam and Eve did not recognize the sinfulness of sin until they felt the nakedness. It's like they, they had to actually feel consequences in order to recognize the fin- sinfulness of sin. Now, Pastor Michael, throwing you a question here. Why do you think we often fail to grasp the sinfulness of sin? Ooh. <clears throat> Uh, Siggy, I, I, I want to skip that question and go to, to, to what you said. I'm coming back. Uh, I had a colleague of mine in, in the seminary who did uh, some research in the Hebrew express, expressions here of the whole fig leaves. And there was actually a, a light quality that came from these leaves. That it's expressed that they not only try to cover themselves, but they try to create their own light. And they try to cover, and that's the whole excuse that you were talking about. Immediately we try to excuse sin, which, which then answers this question. If there is anything that I'm trying to excuse, it can be, watch out, it's probably uh, a sin. We don't excuse other things. The, I, I tell young people this line, uh, if you say one of two things, then it's, it's 99.9% chance it's wrong. If you say everyone else is doing it, it's probably wrong. Because you don't say that about anything good. And secondly, it's not that bad. If, you, if either one of those come to your mind, it's the satanic whisper from the serpent again. Hey, it's not rich. Come on. Why do we not think, we, why, do, why do I think we, we fail to grasp the sinfulness of sin? Uh, D. Casper did a, a great picture in first service of what sin does, the tragedy of the cross, both the tragedy and the beauty of the cross. Uh, I think we, we, we should reset our whole system. This is, this is our current system, all right? We've got two tables up here. Let's call that the good table, and this is the bad table. This is the sinful table. We're the sinners. And between the two, there's a line. I don't know if you can see it because of the flowers, but right behind the flowers, there's this line. And so uh, in this paradigm, I'm the most sinful, and Pastor Alex is, is sinful, but less sinful. And then there's step over the line, and, and, and Mindy is righteous, but not as righteous as Siggy, because he's gone to the far extreme. And we kind of divide this line that if I step over, I'm, and that's not at all the picture that Eve communicates to the serpent. It's back to Scott Bennett's reflection of as a father, he communicates, stay away from the line. The whole idea of God is to go as far away as possible, but where Mindy may, may be perfect where she's at, she may be as far away from sin as she can be where she's at, even if she's not in the same place as Siggy. That's the whole, that's the whole corn stalk is perfect in every st- in every stage. We kind of draw these lines that make it naughty or nice that God has never put there. He said, I need you to go as far as possible. Maybe we don't recognize, grasp the sinfulness of sin because we we failed to grasp the righteousness of right. Like we we failed to grasp what holiness is. I don't, it's it's back to the whole study of of money. If, If I know what true currency looks like, then I recognize the counterfeit. And so maybe it is that we have just drawn this line that we, we can step over and back and forth. And God said, I've never put that line there. You, you are not to even look at the, you're not to touch the fruit. She had a, an accurate cons, uh, grasp of what God was trying to communicate. Stay as far away from hell as possible and be as righteous and holy and faithful. And so maybe if we have a picture of what God wants of us, then the turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of earth will grow strangely rotten. Nathan. Nathan wants to talk. Next time, Nathan gets to sit up here. Yeah, uh, yeah so in my own life, as I've, uh, as I've been studying the scriptures, I think about the metaphor of the lepers, right? So that leper, leprosy was always associated with sin, um, at least at that time. So when you think about, you know, the actual disease of leprosy, you begin to become numb, right? You begin, you know, you start losing feeling in your, you know, in your body. Uh, in my life, 
it's, it's similar that as you progress in sin, you begin uh, losing sensitivity. You become spiritually insensitive to right and wrong. As, as, as you start redefining for yourself what's right and wrong, and you, you know, sometimes we, we, uh, we've said, you know, you're, you're silencing the Holy Spirit, right? So um, it's the same thing with sin, and sin separates us from God. So as you progress in sin, you lose sensitivity. You, you, you lose that. And, and as you're listening to the lies of the enemy, um, yeah, it's just, it, it's a bad situation where um, it does that. I don't know what the effect in my own life is just that, uh, yeah, I'm, I lose sensitivity to, to the Spirit. It's quenching the Spirit. So, uh, I mean, maybe that's a reason. I don't know. And it brings to mind this thought of what we spend time on. Uh, I, see, I see so many... Here. To be part of the panel. <laughs> and we've got plenty of seats. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's the time. I'm looking at the time and it's ticking away. I'm thinking, oh, really? I'm just like at question three of 12 or 14. Um, maybe I just need to quit talking. But, um, you know, the, 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 the sin is, is it, you, you were talking about this, this, this spending time with righteousness. That's what Jesus did, didn't he? He spent time in nature. He spent time in the word of God. And I think that as Adventists, and probably, probably more so as Adventists as anybody else, than anybody else, we, we, like to, we like to chase conspiracies like crazy, don't we? I mean, we, we, we want to research every single thousand, hundred thousand ways that Satan has to make us fall. And I, and I just wonder sometimes, where are we spending our time? Because time is short, and you only have limited time. Maybe it would do us better to spend time in the Word of God, as Jesus did, and when we spend time in the, in the real, God will bring to our mind and show us what the faults is when we see it. Mind, um, character, and personality says, the heart preoccupied with the Word of God is fortified against Satan and mm -hmm. sin. And it's so true, it goes right along with what you were saying. Where our hearts are and where our minds are focused, that's where our treasure is, that's where we're focusing and building that. Absolutely. I uh, have to run through a lot of this really, really quick. I've got way more notes than, than we're going to cover. But in, in Genesis uh, chapter 6, um, just a few chapters later, we see, we see the flood account. And uh, we know that, uh, that Noah preached for 120 years. And so I'll just throw this question out here to you, Siggy. Why do you think that after 120 years of preaching and teaching, uh, the awakening of the masses occurred only after it was too late? Um, only eight went in that ark, and you know I can imagine people were knocking on the doors as, the, as that first raindrop hit. Why is it that that it took that long, and and, and um, what are the implications of that? Uh, they were awakened to a point. They were awakened to the reality that God's power is true. Um, in regards to them being uh, repentant of denying God, maybe not so much. You know, we see it, uh, stories in the Bible where. We see the Pharaoh, we see, uh, who is it, Balaam, and, 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 and these people go through these experiences, and they are awakened at that moment, but then they're like, all right, back to whatever I was doing, you know? So, so they've never seen rain before, you know? Everything's a mist, and, and, and it talks about how God came and sent an angel to close the door, and they, and they saw all of this, and they, and they saw the animals come into the ark and yet they still didn't believe but until that moment that they felt that drop of unknown you know they're like oh it was true but and i, I like the point that he just made mm -hmm. I, I hadn't even thought about that it, 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 they weren't awakened they never were awakened this was this was a, a judas moment mm -hmm. um they they hated the the consequence of their action necessarily but they weren't really uh, awakened to the to the love of Christ and wanting to be with 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 God. Um, fascinating. Thank you, thank you, Siggy, for that. Um, Can I point the finger back? Uh, yes. By the way, panelists, just make sure, for the sake of our sound guys, we're holding up high and close to our mouths. This is the little antenna that blocks their signal. Uh, we can. I, I want to just point some of those fingers, the three that point back to us as Adventists. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that. that that's part of why we like prophecy, because it gives us the timeline to know when to be repentant. It's, there's a little bit of comfort there. Ooh, we, we st we've got, 
and, and the rabbi is, is said to, a rabbi is said to have said, we need to, you need to be repentant the day before you die. And so then the question is, when am I going to die? Answer, well, you better be repentant every day then. Because we don't know when our timeline. But there's a sense that we have sunk our teeth deep into the timelines of prophecy, and we, are, and we have done it well. And, and that's fine, but the whole purpose of the, the timelines was, was to give us a plan for our salvation, not to, not to allow us to, to dilly-dally and to become complacent. So I wonder if we, if we, and we as Adventists don't like this question because it, it comes from a different theology, but if you were to die today, where would you go, right? Don't think, don't think about, well, is it years? Think about today. What, how's my commitment today? Yeah, Siggy. You know, when you ask that question, because we know that we'll go to sleep, the next thing we'll do is wake up, and where will we, where will we be, you know? <laughs> What, what will be our, 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 our end? Um, and that's exactly what happened with the ten virgins. You know, you had this, uh, this awakening experience, the bridegroom is coming, and five are, are, are ready, five are not. And, um, and the five that are not, they find themselves on the outside of the door knocking and uh, wanting entrance, and they don't get entrance. So, Mindy, tell me, I don't want to be on the outside knocking to get into the ark. What can we do right now in order to ensure that we're inside that ark? I keep thinking about what we're talking. We're looking for visual things. We're looking for tangible things, um, like with Adam and Eve and with the ark and all these things. But my mind goes back to Elijah, where he was looking for God in the earthquake and in the fire and the mighty wind and all these things. And it wasn't until he stopped long enough to realize that it wasn't exactly what he thought it would always be, but it was the still small voice of God. And I think on a daily basis, our awakening comes from the still small voice that we choose to pay attention to in the day to day. And it's not always going to be these huge things. Um, how many times have we, when we're about to do something or, um, you know, you feel that still small voice of being, this isn't the right decision. Like you should maybe rethink this. And even after the fact, sometimes it's not an earth-shaking um, consequence that we feel like Adam and Eve did, where they right away knew they were naked, but it comes from God never, God never brings guilt, but he convicts our hearts. And um, I think that it's just in those moments that even after, that that's when repentance comes in the still small ways that we sometimes neglect to look at because we're looking for a huge picture. And we're told that in heaven, even when we don't see the consequences right now, in heaven, the curtains of our, our histories will be pulled back and we'll get to see the full picture. And so that's maybe the first time that we'll really see the consequences of some of the choices that we've made. Um, and so I think it's the day-to-day, -day, the, the small ways that the Holy Spirit, um, we, we read in scripture where the Comforter, the Holy Spirit is sent, and that is what will convict of us, us of our sins as well. And, I think it's in learning to hear that voice and not just reacting to the consequences and the things that we see that we really feel the awakening in our hearts. In the still small voice, and if God speaks in a still small voice, that means that we have to prepare ourselves to hear the still small voice. And I think the reality for many of us is that we're running at 100 miles an hour, uh, even, even more. And, and we're going so fast and so hard on everything that we do that there is no time there is, there is no, well, there's, there's too much noise. There's, there's too much stuff, and, and we can't hear the small voice of God, the Holy Spirit that's prompting us, uh, no, 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 go, go this way or, or go that way. Can, Nathan. Can I, really quick, I just want to read something that's helped me. Sister White writes this about time. She says, the shortness of time is urged as an incentive for us to seek righteousness and to make Christ our friend. This is not the great motive. It savors of selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God be held before us to compel us through fear to right action? This ought not be. Jesus is attractive. He is full of love, mercy, and compassion. He proposes to be our friend, to walk with us through the rough pathways of life. He says to you, I am the Lord thy God. Walk with me, and I will fill thy path with light. Jesus is the majesty of heaven. He proposes to elevate to companionship with himself those who come to him with their burdens, their weaknesses, and their cares. He will make them his dear children. 
so I, I just think in my own life, we are always harking on time. What can I do? What can I do? And it's just, it's just, it's just a relationship with Christ. He just wants a relationship. And when we focus on that, you know, um, we won't be compelled to action through fear. I think that time does that. I don't know. And believing God's promises that, that he really does want to hear us, that he does want to hear your burdens, that, that, that he's there. Dee talked about that last night, that, that we might not feel that, that God is there. He might not be answering fast enough for us. It might not be on our timeline. It not, might not be in the way that we are thinking. But, but the reality is that God is right there next to us every single step of the way, and he cares about what it is that we are, we are uh, suffering. Uh, Amelia brought up that, that quote. I read it recently, I think in Maranatha, about how the, you know, we hear about the shortness of time, and that's always held before us to compel us to act, but that shouldn't be necessary. And plus, we don't know how much time we really have. If we say, oh, such and such is going to happen in this year, and then once that happens, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repent, and then I'm going to come, come to the Lord fully, but, but we never know when our time personally is going to be, is going to be up. So yeah, it's, especially with this theme, with this conference, with awaken, um, that's not wait till a certain time to awaken. That's awaken now. Amen. Uh, I want to talk about somebody that heard that still small voice. Um, Eddie, were you going to say, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say real quick. Um, yeah, I really like that illustration that you brought a while ago, um, Pastor Michael, about the, you know, the tables, because it made me think yeah, you know, as, as humans, we, we like to measure certain sins, right? That's interesting to me because, um, you know, and, and um, a lot of people look back at the garden and they think, well, Adam and Eve just, you know, they just ate part of that fruit. Like, what's the big deal? But, you know, it makes us realize, you know, because if, if it was to be like a brutal sin, like, like murder, you know, something like that, people would be like, okay, well, that... I'm not sinning as bad as them, but God is showing us, like, no, look at what this thing leads to. So that's interesting. And, you know, um, back, going to the flood, what you were saying, um, like why people weren't, you know, even when they saw all these animals going into the ark, why, why weren't they still, you know, like, awakened? But it, it just goes to show the power of influence, right? The power that people have on other people, and, and it's just you know, it's sin, it's numbing us, right? Like back to what Nathan was saying is it's just continually num numbing us when we turn away from God, who is the source of wisdom, we don't have discernment anymore. So yeah, I just thought that was, that was interesting. So, Thank you. I want to look at Abraham for the next, uh, I guess it's about 17 minutes or so. And, you know, we were looking at awakening moments. And, and for Abraham, this is a guy that goes through, through this process of awakening throughout an, an entire lifetime. I mean, it's, it's an entire process for this guy that uh, over, you know, before he has his first child, the promised child uh, through Sarah, um, they're, they're nearly 100. And um, so it, it's a long time that God is, is working with them. One of the first, the very first moments that I see uh, as far as awakening is, is concerned is found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Mindy, read that for us, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless you, those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And of course, Abraham is being called, or Abram at the time is being called out of Ur of the Chaldees. This is where Babel is happening. This is just the, 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 whole, the whole mess there. And, and they're all uh, worshiping false gods, and there's all kinds of horrific things happening there. And so God is saying, hey, get out of there. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull you. I'm going to pull you out of there. Uh, Mindy, in Joshua, Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, um, God, God indicts Terah and um, Abraham's father and Nahor as being idol worshipers, which means that, that Sarah and Abraham grew, grew up in an idol worshipers' home. So what effect do you think that growing up in that family uh, that are idol worshipers had on Abraham and Sarah? 
I think the Bible makes it clear that our parents in the, in the place that we grew up has a huge influence. If not, he wouldn't have told us to train up a child in the way they, sh they should go, and they won't depart from it. And so I know that it had to have had a big influence. It was a lot of what the culture was at the time, too. So it wasn't probably just the household. It was, it was the whole concept. Um, but when God calls, all of his, his biddings are enablings. And he promised all throughout um, history up to that point, and as Pastor D brought out yesterday, too, God's promises are sure. And he promised the line throughout all that, that he would have a line, that he would have a people. And I think that that's the part that's the strongest pull to this. Because I was looking at it, and it's true, in a lot of practical ways. Um, he should have just followed that. But we also see how God promised, so he will enable, and also he provides a way. And he pulls Abraham out of the situation. And sometimes it's the same for us. Sometimes it takes backing up and getting out of the situation. And so I think that, I think that ultimately it was God's plan. And he put in the steps. And Abraham was just faithful in what God had taught him already and how he continued to grow. And we see places throughout, like Abraham is an amazing godly figure in the Bible, but he also fell. He also made mistakes. And um, yeah. And I can't help but wonder, are those mistakes, you know, um, were they implanted there from, from the beginning? Everything that we take into our minds and our hearts, it just sits there. It gets filed away. It gets pulled out. Uh, you know, even, even myself, I, I spent a, a, lot of, a lot of years working in the, in the world. And, and uh, even to this day, um, if I'm in the garage and, and I put a screwdriver through my hand, um, I am surprised at the things that, um, that my mind decides it wants to just blurt out. And it's like, Lord, are you kidding me? I gave you this a long time ago. Why? It sits there in the mind. It's just there, ready to be activated at any point in time. And this is, this is why the Bible is saying, hey, guard your heart, guard your mind. Don't just let anything come in there. Be very, very cautious and careful what comes into, into the mind. Listen, there are, there are many of us that are in different situations, and we have in, in the gymnasium, I, uh, I believe, uh, at least 100-plus young people that were here this morning listening to that. Every single one of us comes from a different place, a different home, a different background. We have different challenges. Many of us at times will find ourselves in situations where we have ungodliness all around us. How can we protect ourselves from being influenced by those things that are around us that we have. So for some young people, they can't move out of their house. Um, and, and for others, you go into a work environment in the, I mean, I, I was just in a, going to a store, coming out of a store the other day, and uh, two or three young people came out there. Uh, they were uh, actually, uh, yeah, they were young people. And, um, and, and then all of a sudden, it was just this, this slew of swear words. Blankety blank, 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 blank. And I've got my little kids. Well, my little daughter is a parrot. All she has to do is think she heard it once. And, and boom, that's, that's her favorite word. And so I'm just, we're influenced by all of this stuff that we can't help. So how, how do we protect ourselves from this? Anybody take that. Uh, just, just wait a minute, just because they there's, can't hear you there's on a crew that. on the live stream that can't hear you. But Chase is fast. He is fast, like it's the long legs, like cowboy fast. So I think um, we can. We don't have to overthink a concept like this. And this is what I'm going to try to teach my girls as they grow. You know, when you um, when you work on a farm, you are going to get dirty. It's just inherent. It comes with the territory. You are milking the cows. You're going to get cow dung on you. You are um, taking care of the chickens. You're going to get filthy. One thing you do every day is you wash, and you go home, and you clean up. And I think in a, a world where it's full of this, this negative influence, um, when it's full of different ideologies and concepts pulling you in different directions, you go home, you take a moment, and you wash. And washing, to me, mind washing, is getting into the Bible, recalibrating. And I think that's, that's probably one of the biggest things that helped me um, growing up and, and living in it. My family's actually Muslim, and I was surrounded by that influence a lot in the family dynamic. And having an opportunity to recalibrate by, by uh, spending time in God's Word, spending time in the spirit of prophecy, it just, when you, when you get confused or you feel like you're being pulled or you feel like you're um, getting dirty, <laughs> you have an opportunity to recenter 
and wash. And I think, I think sometimes we can remove ourselves from the environment, that's true, but when we can't, I think we have to learn to wash. And I think that's, that's an important concept. So. We'll bring the mic up front here next. I'll fill the, uh, with my input here. That, that line that Scott sang after first service, Come to Jesus, uh, is a line that I was giving premarital counseling to a young couple that were not Adventist, and uh, they were living together. And uh, so there came a point where, where we challenged them. I challenged them. What, what about taking a stand for what is right now that you understand that um, before your marriage, what if you take a stand before, for what is right? And I asked them, have you ever done that before? And, and they said these, the one had more of a Christian background, the other, the, the girl did not. And she said, well, we keep having these come to Jesus moments and then we move into separate bedrooms and then we come back together and then we have another come to Jesus moment. And so I just said, well, maybe you need to come to Jesus every day. Maybe we need to come to Jesus every day. That's the only way to defeat this thing is come to Jesus every day. Let our minds be saturated and, and consumed and come to Jesus today, tomorrow. So um, as young adult and coming from a home where I was literally the only one going to church since I was 14 years old, I've learned in my life, well, the Lord had taught me in my life to have my personal time with Him. So it's not just going out and seeing the things. There's some of us that inside our homes are going to see everything or many things that are not going to help us for growing in Christ. So it's very important, those that have children and all of us as young adults, to have time with God, to learn how to, ta how to have our own special time with God and set our spot where, like, where we can find that quiet place, even if, it, if we have to wake up very early in the morning to get to have that quiet time with God. And then He will give us also that wisdom and that, um, that um, power from Him to know, to discern, that discernment, that's the word I'm looking for. So to know what comes from Him, what should we like, have in our lives, and what not. And so this is something that you can teach also to children, even when they are very little, so they can grow up learning that already. And this is what Jesus did, right? He, he said, um, or, or he tells us that, that, that um, he spent nights in prayer and he would go into, uh, sometimes, sometimes all night long, sometimes just uh, you know, alone in the, in, in the garden, uh, trying. Ellen White tells us that sometimes he would go into these all-night prayer sessions and it looked like he was going to die. Mm. But he came out of that revived and ready to work again. And, 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 I, and I love that because I, we cannot keep ourselves from working in the world. That's why we've been placed here, to go and call people home. It's almost over, guys. Jesus is coming soon. But at the same time, um, as, as you were saying, personal time, as, uh, as Scott, you were mentioning, uh, rewashing every single, every single day. This, this is vital to our survival, and God will bless us as we do that. I see a hand down there, a mic. Um, so I think it's so important to, in order to keep hearing that still small voice to not um, forget the power of the Holy Spirit, of what He can do. And so in our home, I've been um, trying to instill in my girls, our girls, that when we pray, we need to pray for the Holy Spirit, that he comes into our hearts so we can hear his voice and we can continue to hear him speak um, because we will have all these trials. We will have all these temptations every day. And if you continually seek him as well, that you pray that his spirit will be in you, then you also have his power. His power is so amazingly great that we often forget that, and we forget that he penetrates through us and helps us through all these things. Um, Psalms 51, 10 what is always one of my favorite verses, create in me a clean heart, O God, and create a steadfast spirit in me. But over the last week, I read the next verse, and I've heard it before, but cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. 
David mm. even talks about that spirit being in him. We don't want that taken away from us. Um, and I just think we need to remember to pray for each other, pray mm. for our children, pray over them while they're sleeping for the Holy Spirit to be with us all. Amen. Someone uh, texted in, well, it's John Chamberlain. He's in the lobby apparently holding his daughter. But he said, we must not forget the sharing aspect, that sharing actually, sharing Jesus uh, builds Jesus in me. So to say something to somebody else, it says it to myself. So the washing that Scott was talking about is not just coming in and, and, and sort of being a hermit inside. You have this outreach aspect uh, of it as, as well. Uh, that's, that's, ap that's absolutely beautiful. Wanna want to quickly look at, go ahead. Mind, um, and I feel like it's, it's important, especially because I feel like our target audience is this, uh, this weekend. Um, but I remember like in younger years, you know, you hear some of these concepts of like spending time with Jesus and all these things. And sometimes I would find myself where I'm like, I'm doing this. Like I'm spending time with him. I'm searching for him. I'm trying to do everything that I keep hearing. But yet sometimes it's just not quite there yet. And um, so I'm thinking of like when I was in high school and things that you feel like you're doing all the actions. You feel like you're seeking God. And God promises that he's going to be found, but sometimes it takes asking super intentionally. Like God wants us to ask for specifics because it's in that that we see him specifically. And so just kind of a thought that came to my mind, and I think it's worth sharing, um, is just that intentionality. So if anybody's struggling with that, like sometimes you need to ask for the specific to see the specific answer instead of the big picture. And sometimes that's what it takes to bring that relationship. Persistence, keep on going no matter what. God is there and, and being intentional. Abraham so, has so many different awakening moments. One of those awakening moments is when, uh, when the Lord shows up and he says, I'm about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, that, if that's not an awakening moment, and when he, he looks up and he sees the smoke ascending, I can't imagine what was going through his mind during that period of time as, as, as well. But I, I want to fast forward here at the end because we only have a few minutes left. I want to fast forward to... Um, probably one of the greatest awakening moments that Abraham had, and that is the request to, um, uh, to sacrifice his son. Um, and this is probably not fair to you because we have three minutes left to discuss this. But um, what an awakening moment. You know, the Lord, he knows the Lord's voice. He's been walking with the Lord, and, and the Lord says, hey, I need you to do something for me. And uh, Abraham says, yeah, yeah, Lord, I'll do anything for you. I need you to take your son and sacrifice him to me. And he does that. He does that. And, and so I, I've, got, I've got all kinds of uh, difficulties with that request. Um, but I want to talk about that, that awakening moment here in, in the last moments. Um, what, uh, it says that he tested Abraham. He tested Abraham. Why, and I'm just kind of going off script here, guys, but why is it that Abraham needed to be tested in this way. What was it about Abraham that, that still needed to be tested after a hundred years or so, um, after wandering the wilderness, after obey, obeying and leaving Ur of the Chaldees? What is it that he still is, is struggling with that all of a sudden God says, I'm going to test you in that radical way? Everything that he had ever hoped for, every dream that he'd ever had was to have children. Uh, the greatest blessing God gave him was his son, and yet, and he was, you know, overwhelmingly happy. It was like his, his dream came true. God provided what he had seeked, and now God's saying, all right, well, you know, I gave you this, but what I can give, I can take, so, and, I, and, and, and that, that's just powerful, you know, that was everything the whole beginning of his story. Mm -hmm. uh, the question that would come to me was, is, does it have to be about Abraham? Or could God say to Abraham, I need to use you for a much bigger purpose than even outside yourself? Is everything that ha is happening to me because of me or about me? Or could God be using me to bless an entire group of people? Um, I will say this is my, one of my favorite passages, Genesis 22, verse 2. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. That's the first reference to love in the Bible. That's the first reference to love in Scripture. And so here's this plan of salvation and love. Uh, be, we know it's there, and, and God intentionally uses that. 
inserts this word, now I'm going to teach you about love. I'm going to teach you about love. Because you can do all the obedient things and be right. But without love, it's not it. That's the rich young ruler right there. You know, you've done this, but love, your, love the Lord your God. And he had, had trouble with that. Uh, you know, for me, I, I thought about the Tower of Babel, going back to the Tower of Babel. We were going to spend time with that today, but we didn't have time to get it. But um, that's where, that's where uh, Abraham came out of. He came out of the Chaldees. He came out of all that stuff. There was child sacrifice happening down there. There were human sacrifices happening there at, at that tower, all kinds of, of, of things like that. And, and I, it's fascinating to me that this is the test that God would choose in the end. And, and I, I just wonder... I wonder if God is trying to drain Abraham of all of the connections, all of the things that he has learned uh, in the past and, and saying, no, that's not the way it is. I'm going to use an example of what you heard before, and I'm going to correct that, and, and I'm going to use that, as, as you're saying, Pastor, I'm going to use that to show the world what, what I'm actually going to do, the real sacrifice that changes lives and will, and will save folks. Listen, uh, we're, we're done. We're, we've run out of time, but I, I just want to make this one last appeal. Guard your heart. Guard your mind. There are so many influences that are happening out there, and it's so easy to just think, oh, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not being affected by this. Know that subconsciously your mind is this computer that is registering everything it sees, everything it hears, everything it touches, everything it tastes, all your senses are in hyperactive mode, collecting data, and it gets filed away in your mind. And it has to be washed away. Wash it away through the blood of Jesus Christ, and then God guarantees that you'll be in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the lessons that we learn through Scripture. I thank you for all the stories, the good ones, the bad ones, the ugly ones, the beautiful ones, everything just laid out bare. Because when we read scripture, we realize that is our life. We resonate with these things. And, and we're so gracious for, uh, grateful for a God that, that knew what we needed. And you wrote those things in the word of God to bring us, bring us strength. T today, Father, today we ask that we will re be renewed. You, you gave David a new heart. You gave uh, King Saul a new heart, too. He blew it. But David took this father opportunity, and, and you call him uh, a man after your own heart. And so here's what we're asking this morning. I pray that you'll give us a new heart, that you will take the crusty, old, black, dark, and violent heart that we have, you'll rip it out, and you'll place in it the heart of Jesus. Bless us, Father, as we continue striving. We want to be inside the ark. We want to be in the kingdom of heaven when you come. And so, Father, I ask that you will take us and hold us and shape us into a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen.